Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Louis Hall, CEO of Cerulean. I founded Cerulean back in 1999 as an MBO out of a company that was then called Logica. And Andrew actually joined us back in February. So, so he, he replaced the CFO who was with us from early 2000s. He, he retired uh, last year. Andrew, would you like to give a quick introduction? Yeah, sure. So as Louis said, I joined the business um, back in February. Um, before that, I worked for Vitec, where I was for seven years in total um, in a number of different roles. Um, and I started my career at Deloitte, where I did my ACA exams. Great. Thank you, Andrew. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about what Cerulean actually does. And to give you some sort of background in the company. So we're a, a provider of enterprise software to make mostly to telecoms businesses. And essentially what we do is we provide the software that connects the telecoms businesses networks to their customers. And we have a pretty much 360 wrapper around everything that telcos do to deliver services to customers and earn revenues from doing that. So it's pretty fundamental. It's not nice to have. It's not you know a marginal piece of software. It is absolutely fundamental to running telco businesses. And, and this, this we do through a product suite that's composed of a number of different modules. And these modules can be sold separately, but most commonly they're sold as a suite. And we don't sell every single module every time, but to most new customers, we're selling the majority of our modules. And these, these modules cover everything from um, onboarding customers through our CRM software, also covers the B2B side, um, so things like configure price quote, campaign management, and so on. We also provide the, the online self-service software that customers can use to onboard themselves and to manage their own services once they've been onboarded. And we also provide mobile apps that end customers use to, again, to look at their bills and manage their usage and balances and, and so on and so on. In terms of what telcos are actually selling, we, we have a sophisticated product catalog module that enables telecoms businesses to build these complex bundles of services that are helping them to you know, maximize the, the, the investments they're making in network infrastructure. So this is this is the sort of thing where you combine fixed wire, mobile, broadband, and TV services to sort of repackage and, and, and revalue the, 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 their offering to the, the customer. Once customers have been onboarded, we have a, a service manager module, which then does all the complicated communications with the network elements. And bear in mind, of course, in when we're dealing with quad play, multiple service products, you're talking to TV elements, you're talking to um, mobile platforms, um, fiber provisioning platform, and so on and so on. So this is a really complicated um, bit of software that, that um, is fundamental to automating the process of, of order to cash for telcos. Um, once those customers are onboarded, then we're tracking their usage in real time of all those services, managing their balances, working out when overage needs to be applied, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, this is so fundamental that if this stops working, um, then customers can't make mobile phone calls, for example. Uh, but this, of course, has a lot of replication across multiple geographic sites and so on and so on. So one one node falls down and then some, it has to automatically be restarted somewhere else. So again, very sophisticated, um, high performance software. And then <clears throat> once we've done all of that, we have a, a, a revenue manager module, which is all about putting stuff onto bills, managing taxation, receivables, collections, so on and so on. There are other modules around us without spending all the time talking about the, the technical stuff that, that you know, are all part of the suite of things that telcos need to do to be in business. So, so that in terms of how we deliver that, we're providing this almost entirely these days on a, a SaaS basis, so software as a service, where you know, traditionally, if you go back 10 years, we were selling customers a software license, a support and maintenance contract, and we'd go to their premises, we'd install the software on their hardware, and we'd train their internal IT team to operate it. That's really fading fast. And today, we're, we're predominantly offering a service whereby you know, we host the software in the cloud, and we operate and manage that software on the customer's behalf. And the, the customer simply you know, logs on to use the different modules of the solution. So it's not, there's no, they don't need an IT team, they don't need hardware. That That's um, very much um, out the window. And you know, even in scenarios where regulation requires telcos to have their data 
in country or on their own premises even we're effectively operating a private cloud solution there where we we might actually put the hardware in their own data center sometimes but we we manage that on their behalf and host the private cloud for that customer so so the the the, the business model is essentially that we're selling uh a initial services project to implement our solution and and, and that typically will take nine to 12 months, sometimes a little bit longer for the, the bigger implementations. There's a lot of getting around the, the business to understand exactly how they operate, understanding different business processes, how to put those into our workflow, the products they're going to sell. And you know, telcos will sell thousands of combinations of products. It's a very complex piece. Um, all the testing and so on and, and integration with uh, general ledgers and networks and, and so on and so on. So, so that, that that's a fairly you know, meaty services project that we're selling. And we recognize that revenue on a, on a project completion basis. We're then selling a subscription uh, fee for use of the software, which covers software license, um, hosting of the solution, operation of the solution, support and maintenance. Um, and, and, and that subscription fee is, is, is broken down into those different elements internally for us, because we have to account for license revenue separate to services revenue within that. But um, as far as the customer is concerned, it's just a subscription fee. We have today about 80 customers across all over the world. I think we're at 45 different countries now. And one thing to say is that telecoms is a very globalized market. So the way telecoms works in Brunei is the same as it works in uh, California, is the same as it works in Belgium. So, so we, we have the benefit of being able to do the same thing in whichever country and work with people who have the same knowledge in whichever environment. Um, and that that's very very important in terms of enabling us to to expand and and, and evolve. Our, our headquarters is London. We have about a hundred people in London. Uh, our, our our biggest people base is in Pune in India. Where we have about 180 people. We've we've this year opened two additional offices in India: one in Ahmedabad, in Gujarat, and one in Indore, um, where we're broadening out our our resource um, centers to just to help with the the growth that we have and to deal with some of the inflationary pressures we've seen in in, in the, the bigger cities in India like Pune. Um, and then we have sales presence in 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 Brussels, Singapore and Sydney. We've also just at the end of last year opened an office in Bulgaria where we're building services resources again to help spread the load of the need to grow our, our consultant base and have more places to do that from also helps in terms of managing the cost effectiveness of these resources so they're not all employed in the uk for example so in terms of the financial highlights we, we've had a, a another good year and i think that the thing that we're most pleased about is we've managed to maintain our growth rate at 25 percent. it's actually 26 percent this year so We've transformed from being a business that from IPO was growing at around nine, ten percent a year until 2021, when we we, we saw a, a, a ramp up in growth to 25 percent. And I think it was important that we were able to prove in 22 that this wasn't a one-off. We could sustain that that increase in momentum. Uh, so, so why is, why has that increase in momentum happened? What, what what's the what explains that? Uh, and I think the answer is that that we have, you know, well, first of all, the, the telco background in terms of the market is very strong. And, you know, we are, we are in the midst of these two huge waves of telco investment into 5G mobile and, and into fiber rollouts. So telcos with these big network investments are then turning to the ancillary software that connects those networks to the customers, which is what we do, uh, and looking at how they can improve that software to better monetize those investments. So how do we, essentially, how do we get more value from the customers by giving them better service and offset that investment cost. And, and you know, not, not all the systems they have are flexible enough to open to do that. So, so that that's a you know, that, that's a market backdrop. In terms of Cerulean, I think we built our credibility steadily with larger customers and larger deals. And you know, over the last over the last five years since IPO, every year our largest ever contract win has has pretty much gone up. So if you go back to IPO, uh, our largest contract win in that year, I think was about 2 million or so um, pound value, selling value. And you know, the, the latest contract we signed in July 22 was, was uh, 15 million. So you've seen a, a very steady increase in 
in our ability to sign larger contracts, also with larger customers. And I think that that just generates some momentum of its own, which is this credibility to do more sophisticated, bigger, bigger projects. And alongside that, we've had this transition to the software as a service model, which just puts a lot more things in the bag. So if we're selling just license and support, then you know the value is fairly limited. If we're selling a five-year term license, five years of, of, of SaaS, which is all of the hosting and the services around managed service and so on, then it's a much there's just much more stuff to much more value being added, and and that that creates a higher price. So I think that those are the the main drivers behind why we've seen this increase in momentum, and you know we'll we'll, we'll, we'll look at the numbers and Andrew will talk about the numbers in detail in a moment. But this is a, a picture of our, our new customer pipeline. So this is the, the total value of all new customers in new logo prospects in our pipeline. That had jumped 43% between the end of 21 and the end of 22. So we have quite a bulge in that pipeline, and we're expecting that to start to, to fall out into financial 23. And if we achieve that, then we're in a very strong position to continue our, our growth rate at this level into 24 and 25. In terms of 23, we uh, our back order increased in 22 by 8%, even though we had a, a, a slight fall off in total new orders in the year. That was off the back of a big jump at 43% in 21. But in 22, 98% of the revenue that we earned was from customers who are customers at the start of the year. For 23, we feel we have enough gas in the tank to provide enough cover to, to, to deliver the 23 numbers that are out there in the market, as long as we don't mess up execution. So you know, there's enough fuel to, to get us there. Uh, so we're not particularly concerned about 23. Conversion of that pipeline I was just showing you is all about how we maintain this momentum in 24 and 25. So we've spoken about the overall growth. Recurring revenue also important. So in, in general terms, as we sell bigger deals to bigger customers, um, we're, we will increase recurring as a percentage of our overall revenue. It's currently running at 38%. But as we sell bigger licenses um, with bigger recurring fees around them, then that will um, enhance the, the proportion of recurring in, in our mix. It's also worth saying that, that what we don't show in our numbers is the value of, of term license renewals. So every five years term licenses renew, we're not that's we're not including that in our recurring revenue because it's not strictly speaking recurring revenue, but that obviously is pent up recurring value in the in the mix that it that, that will be repeated. Um, so I think I'll hand over to Andrew now to, to talk about the numbers in some more detail. Thanks very much. So, so if we start at the top left hand chart in terms of uh, revenue, you can see the the growth of around nine to ten percent from 2017 to 2020. Um, with a step change in performance in 2021 of 25% and 26% in, in 2022. Um, part of this, as Louis was saying, is driven by an increase in the recurring revenue run rate, which is you can see in the chart on the right-hand side there. So in 2022, the £12.4 million pounds, uh, made up 38% of, of total revenue in the year. Um, and as Louis said, over time, we would expect that to continue to increase. In the chart on the right hand side, what you can see, part, part of what makes up the recurring revenue run rate is managed service revenue run rate. I mean, in 2022, that increased by 60, 68%. Um, so it's therefore showing very strong growth and is really helping to drive an increase in the recurring revenue run rate. Um, turning to the chart in, in the middle in terms of the back order, um, the back order of £45.4 million is made up of two numbers. Um, so 37.4 million pounds of orders that have been contracted but not yet turned into revenue. And on top of that, there's 8 million pounds of annualized support and maintenance revenue. And as Louis was saying, this gives us very good visibility um, into performance going into 2023. I'm um, turning to the chart on the right in terms of net cash, you can see very strong cash performance over the past few years, which continued in 2022 with closing net cash of 20.2 million pounds. As you can see in the chart below that, this, this enabled us to continue with our progressive dividend policy. 
um, the total dividend has increased by 28% um, in 2022 to 9.1 pence per share. This actually makes up a relatively small proportion of our overall free cash flow. So I think we are very well positioned uh, to continue paying the, the pro progressive dividend policy um, going into future years. Uh, finally, on this slide, looking at adjusted PBT and adjusted EPS on the bottom row here, um, adjusted PBT increased by 40% versus last year. So clearly, you know, this is much higher than the growth in revenue of 26%. So as we are gaining the incremental revenue um, on the top line, that is dropping through to profit um, at a very decent rate. So turning to the next slide, this shows the financial highlights for the year. And as you can see, 2022 was a very strong year. Revenue up 26%. There was an increase in the EBITDA margin to 42%. Um, and as I said before, an increase in net cash to £20.2 million. Now, in terms of the driver behind that revenue, you can see that was driven by an increase in services revenue due to the implementation of a number of major projects during the year. So if we turn to slide 13, um, this really shows the change in, in the revenue mix over the year. So in terms of services revenue, that increased from 46% up to 56% in 22. At the same time, the software revenue fell from 51% down to 39%. Now, this fall in the software revenue is really driven by the timing of license revenue recognition. So as some of you will be aware, we, we have to recognise license revenue in line with IFRS 15, the accounting standard, which enables us only to recognise the revenue once control of the software has been passed to the customer and it's been implemented on the customer's system. So given that the license revenue is our highest earning revenue segment, because the incremental revenue pretty much drops all the way through to, to profit, you might have actually expected there to have been a decline in the profit performance over the year. But what we've actually seen is the adjusted EBITDA margin increased to 42% from 40.3% in the prior year. At the same time, we managed to maintain our gross margin in line with prior year at 78%. So there's a couple of major factors um, that moved in our direction during the year. Um, the first being that we continued our strategy to continue to, to hire people in India and Bulgaria. And due to the, the cost differential between those two countries in the UK, this actually helped us to, in, to, to reduce the average cost per head year on year, which therefore helped to, to offset the impact of the change in, in revenue mix. On top of that, there was an increase in the services day rate, which increased to our highest ever level. Um, and this was driven by higher resource utilization across the year. So effectively, our people were being were working more efficiently than ever before. And again, this helped to, to maintain the margin at 78%. In terms of the, the adjusted EBITDA margin increasing to 42%, um, there's a couple of additional factors driving that as well. Um, one is that we continue to very, focus very closely on cost control. So in terms of operating expenses on a constant currency basis, they increased by 10%, despite the increase in revenue of 26%. So again, that helped to improve our margins. And finally, we should point out there was also some, some impact from favourable FX in the year in OPEX, which also helped to, to deliver that high margin that we saw. So the next slide just looks at cash generation in a bit more detail. Uh, the table at the top shows a reconciliation of adjusted EBITDA down to free cash flow. And I think the thing that stands out there is that the working capital was flat across the year, despite the 26% increase in revenue. Now, I think going forward, as we hope to continue the growth story, um, we would probably expect to see an increase in working capital, driven firstly by an increase in, in receivables and, and accrued income, and secondly, by the change in revenue mix. Because if we recognise more licensed revenue, we're likely to recognise more accrued income, which will then unwind over a period of, of typically a five-year term licence period when it gets turned from, from profit into cash. In terms of the graph at the bottom, this shows a reconciliation of opening net cash through to closing net cash. I mean, I think the key point here is that the free cash flow of £10.7 million 
was far greater than the outflows from dividends from the purchase of shares to satisfy the save as you earn scheme and also lease payments as well. And this shows how we get to the closing net cash of 20.2 million pounds. In terms of the detailed income statement, really three additional points to mention here. First is that we continue to invest in R&D. So across the year, we invested 10,000 days into R&D activities in order to keep our software up to date. In terms of the accounting implications, we capitalized a million pounds of development costs, which was broadly offset by 900,000 pounds of amortization relating to previously capitalized development costs. Secondly, in terms of the depreciation and amortization balance you can see there of three million pounds, that included a million pounds relating to amortization of acquired intangibles. Now this balance is gonna be fully amortized by March, 2023. So from that period onwards, the run rate of depreciation and amortization will be about a million pounds lower than the three million pounds that you can see here. Finally, in terms of tax rate, there was a small increase in the tax rate in the year to 14.2%. And I think we should point out that in 2023, we would expect there to be an increase in the tax rate driven by the government's recent announcement that the UK corporation tax rate will be increasing from 19% up to 25%. In terms of the consolidated balance sheet, I think really the key point here is that the balance sheet is incredibly strong overall. You can see the net cash balance of 20.2 million pounds. Uh, we have no debt at all because this was fully repaid in the prior year. And in terms of net assets, they grew by 32% over the year. Finally, here you can see the consolidated cash flow statement. This reconciles the adjusted EBITDA balance at the top of 13.8 million pounds through to the cash generated in the period um, and shows how that led to closing net cash of of 20.2 million pounds. Um, I think I have previously covered the key points here, um, so I don't want to duplicate um, what I said before, um, but please let me know if you've got any questions on this. Thank, thank you, Andrew. For those of you who, who are new to the company, a um, little bit of background on how we get to market. So you can essentially think of, of telecoms businesses as tier ones and large tier twos, and then to tier twos and tier threes. And we do have a different approach to these different scales of businesses. So for the very largest telcos, we do have some of those as customers, but we provide something in a niche. And that's sometimes just providing one or two of our modules. So for example, for KDDI in Japan, we provide essentially the module that, that manages where the infrastructure is in the ground, in the air, capacity or network and all of that stuff. And then we also provide a whole suite solution to the larger telcos but to particular brands, for example. So in Belgium, we provide most of our solution to Proximus, which is the BT of Belgium, if you like, but um, only for their, their challenger consumer mobile brand, uh, not for all of their customers in Belgium, London, Luxembourg. Um, so that's how we interact with the larger telcos. And with the sort of, sort of the, the, the mid-sized, smaller ones, um, we generally provide everything uh, to, to all of their brands. So we can, we can address different points in the market with different approaches. Um, we also work with channel partners. So, so Nokia are an important channel partner for us. Uh, and uh, I think Nokia do enable us to get to some markets we wouldn't otherwise reach, particularly Middle East, for example. So we have a big project with Nokia in Egypt at the moment, um, quite a strategic deal for them. So very useful for us. Um, we also work with GE, General Electric, uh, famous for aero engines, I guess, but they also have a, a large software business. And they sell digital mapping tools that, that they then bundle with our network inventory solution. And you know, they sell that uh, as white label under their brand. Um, and then we also work with some of the larger integrators like the TCSs of the world, Infosys, and, and some of the US um, providers, where, where we're more in a kind of introducing us into, into potential deals where they might do some work alongside of us rather than prime contracting, which is the relationship with Nokia and GE. In terms of the competition, there is competition, uh, unfortunately. How do we differentiate ourselves against that competition? So we break the competition into these three groups. It, so we, there are the large independent software vendors or ISVs as we call them. And, and these are organizations like Oracle, for example, that they, they have a suite of software in this area. And you know, how do we beat the biggest players? Really because what we're offering, you know, our USP is that we have a product solution 
It's not bespoke for any individual customer. All of our customers have the same software. And uh, you know, if a customer wants a customized version, they can't have it. We, we can add features to the product, which we will happily do if they, if they really are generic enhancements, but we don't allow any customer to have a, a customized special version. And that has uh, huge benefits in terms of the ability to deploy standard product each time um, in terms of uh, lower risk, lower cost of ownership for the customer, and a much faster implementation, added to the fact that those solutions are much easier to upgrade going forward. And then in the middle, you have the network equipment vendors. So this is basically Nokia and Ericsson in the, the West. Nokia are partners, not a competitor. Ericsson do have a suite of software in this space, in, in the ancillary software space, enterprise software space. And uh, you know they have a large customer base. And then there's some smaller ISVs, uh, more our kind of scale, they tend to be focused on particular areas of telco and, and on particular regions, but there really is almost, there are very, very few players at this level who can provide the whole gambit of, of what we do and what these bigger guys do. In terms of, of where the customers are, you'll see from, from this logo wall, a very broad range of different kinds of telcos. In terms of geography, uh, normally about half of our revenue comes out of Europe. Uh, last year, 21, we had a much higher concentration in Europe because we were doing a lot of work with new European customers. It's fallen back in 22, more in line with historic norms. Uh, but it's fair to say that Europe is the most dynamic market in telecoms at the moment, I think. So, um, you know, we, we, we expect Europe to remain a, a very strong market for us going forward. Um, I'll, I'll just very briefly on customer concentration, because uh, this can be a concern for some people. The point here is that the customers in these top 10 slots are different customers in most years. So this is a feature of the fact that when a new customer comes on board, we're recognizing a lot of the revenue from that initial contract in the first 12 months, because in the first 12 months, we're recognizing most of the project services revenue to install the system, all of the, the term license revenue because of what Andrew was talking about earlier on, on IFRS 15, and, and that just creates a, a, a large bulge. And also when existing customers have major upgrade projects, for example, uh, again, that will push them back into the top 10. But once they're, that, that major upgrade is complete or once the new customer has gone to service and they're into the sort of recurring uh, software as a service subscription mode, they're not in the top 10 revenue customers anymore. I hope that makes sense. Very quick explanation. If anyone wants to ask a question about that, obviously feel free. Um, <clears throat> I won't dwell on this one. This is just uh, showing the uh, point I was making earlier on that in, in any given year, the vast majority of our revenue comes from customers that are already customers at the start of the year. So only the grey revenue at the top is from customers who are new customers in, in any given year, which gives us a huge amount of visibility in terms of in terms of the, the, the current year that we're in. So, so really, you know, the, the, those are the key points. Uh, we, we feel really positive about 23, we've certainly got the gas in the tank. We have to deliver. We always have to deliver. Uh, but we have got the gas in the tank to get there. We've also got a very strong pipeline uh, for business to close in 23 that will fuel 24 and 25. So, so all in all, um, you know, we, we are enthusiastic about the future. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Louis. And we have um, lots of questions, actually. Is your pipeline of 209 million made up of purely qualified sales leads, or does it also include marketing leads as well? That, that, that's a good question. So, so leads only get into the pipeline if they become opportunities. So, so I think the answer to that is, uh, in terms of where, where that question is going, is that if something, something which is just a, a bare lead off the street doesn't go straight into the pipeline, it has to be qualified first. And the next question is, accrued income seems quite high at approximately 30% of revenue. How does this measure compare with your competitors' accrued income or revenue percentage? And can you give us some insight into what makes up the accrued income numbers and how the numbers are calculated? Sure. So, so I'll have a go at answering that. So, so if we think about what, what accrued income is, it's when we recognise revenue, um, but haven't yet built the customer. So if you if you break down what our contracts are made up of, it's, it's typically, you know, a third licence revenue, a third implementation work and a third support and maintenance um, revenue on top of that. So in terms of looking at the revenue recognition in, in terms of each of those strands, 
The license revenue under IFRS 15, you have to recognize up front, even though you know, the customer will typically pay over the five year period. And what that means is at the start of the contract, you would typically expect to recognize about a third of the contract up front. Um, and therefore you'll be recognizing quite a high element of accrued income, which will only unwind over the five year period as the, as the customer pays. Um, in terms of kind of comparison against other companies, you know, I, I don't think we've got any any comparators to hand, but um, you know, ho- hopefully that explanation of um, of kind of explaining how the accrued income is built up versus the uh, versus the contract. But, but I, I think that will be normal because the model is standard. You know, everyone's working for the same accounting regulation, so I don't think it'd be particularly different to our competitors. Tremendous. Thank you very much. And another quick one for you, Andrew. In which year does the depreciation drop by approximately one million? Yeah, so we would expect the depreciation amortisation to go down by half a million pounds in 2023 um, and then a further half a million pounds in 2024. Thank you very much. And can you give us your thoughts on why software revenue as a percentage of total revenue decreased versus last year? Was it higher implementation revenue from the new larger customers? Andrew? Yeah, no, absolutely. That, that The higher level of services revenue was driven by um, implementation due to a number of major projects that we worked on during the year. It's also worth pointing out that um, if you think about when license revenue gets recognised, um, it, it it will get recognised within typically within the first twelve months of the, of the engagement. But if we sign a project, you know, in July, for example, that may not have actually got to the point of license recognition stage. So without, without speaking out of turn, uh, it will be reasonable to see that there's some overhang of of license from work that was being done on customer new customers in 22 that would appear in 23. Thank you very much. And what are the main hurdles you need to overcome to keep signing bigger and bigger customers? I, I think you know, we need to keep delivering. Uh, it, it's all about, you know, telecoms is a small world and it's all about referenceability. So for example, we're, we're, we're shortlisted for a, a, a new customer in Europe at the moment. and without us even realizing that potential new customer had already called three of our existing customers in Europe and, and caught that complete lowdown on, on whether we were any good. So, you know, that, that that's a really, really important thing. Um, and we have to keep evolving the software. So we invest 10,000, last year we invested 10,000 man days in R&D. We'll invest more than that this year. Uh, so we have to keep evolving the solution, keeping up to date with you know, architectural evolution, but also adding more and more features. Um, I think you know, those are the keys. Thank you very much. And do you expect that as you sign larger and larger customers, the proportion of revenue from the top 10 will come down or this will continue with the larger new ones replacing your previous customers? No, absolutely right. That, that, that's, that, that, that's a good point, which I didn't make. Uh, and the, the, because as the base expands and revenue from the base will become more dominant, than revenue from new customers that are in the process of being implemented, we would expect that concentration, even though they're different customers, still to come down. Regarding customer number three in operating segments from 5.2 million to 3.4 million, was this in the main because last year it was the customer's first year? And does this mean in 2023 we should expect a similar number to the 3.4 million? You wouldn't necessarily expect the customer, the, the, the top customers, to be the same group of customers um, from from year to year. So it could be that, um, you know, customer number three, there was a large implementation in 2021, and that continued into 2022. Um, there could be some some license that was recognised in 21, but but not 2022. I, I, I don't think you can necessarily expect, you know, that high level of revenue to continue from that customer into 2023 and beyond i think it's just the nature of the of the model that you know the top customers will and that, that's, what we're, that's what we're talking about when we speak about concentration so that customer is cycling out of again we, we, we haven't named the customer but one assumes that's one that was in implementation is cycling out of implementation and will be replaced by another customer in high spending mode either existing customer in an upgrade program or some other major project or another new customer 
Thank you very much. And you have a large cash balance, strong balance sheet and highly rated shares. Do you have any aspirations to do any large acquisitions or indeed any smaller bolt on acquisitions? And if so, how would you finance them? Well, we did approach Alphabet, but they're a bit busy right now. And <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, joking apart, um, no, we, we, we do have a, a strategy to find um, businesses that have products that will slot into our jigsaw. Um, we, we, uh, we, our positive, our strategy has changed that when we started out at IPO, we were looking much more at transformational acquisitions because we're a much smaller company by market cap. And we couldn't see how we could get the value to any sensible level without doing that. I think because we've, we've gained momentum in growth, momentum in, 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 in rating, um, we're, 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 we're more focused on the organic growth than inorganic growth now. And we see inorganic growth as tuck-ins, bolt-ons that won't risk upsetting the apple cart uh, uh, too much. That will be easy to swallow and absorb. But bringing in businesses that have products that we can slot in, that we can then resell to upsell to our existing customers and vice versa, we can upsell our existing product to the new customers we bring in with a new business. There's a lot of logic in that, uh, as well as, of course, that it enhances our general offering to the market. So that's very much where our strategy lies um, on that front. And do your customers have their own separate ERP systems for their accounting processes? Or does your software cater for that as well? And if not, is that an opportunity? So the simple answer is that we handle uh, essentially accounts receivables. So all the accounts receivable ledger. We, we don't do uh, GL, general ledger. And I don't think it makes any sense for us to, to do that. I mean, it, it, it's a well-trodden, commoditized specialist path. You know, we, we, it doesn't make sense for us to replicate SAP or Oracle Financials or whatever. I, I, I just don't, I don't think there's any, anything to be gained there. Um, and it's not, it's not software, which is high value sale um, as it is such a commoditized piece. Thank you. And as you're moving to a recurring revenue model, what's your current churn rate versus new customers, i.e. the drop-off or new subscriptions? So I, I think we these are really, really, it's a good point. These are really, really sticky customers. And, you know, we from deciding to, to, to go to a new solution, a new platform, it's, it's at least three years. And that's if you go with Cerulean, because you, it, it'll take a year to choose a, a partner, six months to contract, and, and you know by the time you actually get started. So, but if you go with some of these more bespoke solutions that most of our competitors provide, it's it's five years. And so, so we 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 tend not to lose customers very often. Uh, we we don't actually publish a churn rate because it's not really that kind of business. So so whilst we're offering a SaaS model that's having committed many millions of dollars to to actually installing sorry I say installing implementing a solution um because even though we're 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 providing in the cloud it still has to be configured with the customer's workflow processes the customer's products connected to the customer's networks and so on and so on so it's not the case that you can simply turn off a subscription from from this platform on monday and turn on the subscription for the new platform the following Monday. It's it's a much more difficult process. So where do you see your subscription percentage as a percentage of revenue in five years' time? That, that's a good question. I, I think that we would expect the majority of our revenue to be the SaaS subscription revenue in five years' time. And regarding the future growth potential, as you're dealing with telcos, how large do you see your addressable market? Oh, it's huge. I mean, I'd be surprised if we have, I mean, depending on which analyst you look at on size of market, I'd be surprised if we had 1% of the market. Uh, it's an enormous market. It's very fragmented. It, there's no dominant provider. Um, and, you know, I think we can uh, gain the reputation, continue to gain the reputation as the product SaaS based provider in a market that has traditionally been dominated by bespoke solutions and, and you know, make really big strides in that market. And you slightly touched on it, but what exactly led to the radical change in the growth of revenues post-2021? Did the pandemic somehow influence this? I don't think the pandemic was a major contributor. I think the pandemic has certainly strengthened telecoms businesses' hand in terms of 
Now, it's now clear that everyone needs great broadband infrastructure, whether it's mobile, fixed or whatever. And you know, that, that is more center stage. So that's encouraged telcos to maintain these investment cycles. But but the, the, these investment cycles were going before, you know, we're, we're in the wings before COVID um, and, and it's, you know, we're underway before COVID. So COVID didn't start that. Um, I, I think as I said before, it's it's really just a sort of build, build of a momentum us having got gained credibility to do to provide our software to larger telcos in larger deployments and having proven that in you know in execution and, and in operations plus the fact that we're doing a lot more now because we're doing not just here's your software license and we'll install it and here's your maintenance we're, we're operating the system we're um hosting the system and providing that as a software as a service wrapper and that just increases the deal size um, so, so you know, I think I mean you could add in other factors like the Chinese vendors, for example, are out of our markets in Europe and North America, which is which are big markets for us. Um, but that was you know that was happening before COVID. So I, I don't think that in itself is a factor, but it certainly certainly helps. Thank you. And if you've only got one percent market share, what do you see as the major factors holding you back, and how over time would you see that increasing? So I, I think that um, you know we, we're constrained to an extent by 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 having to by, by implementing the solutions themselves. So so it it can take three, four, five thousand man days of effort to, to get one of these solutions into service. And as we expand, we'll be looking to hand off a lot of that services work to integration partners, so the likes of you know, TCS, Emphasis, Technohindra. Uh, Cap Gemini and so on, um, who have big benches of resources, so that we're not constrained uh, by that. And I think if we were to go on and, as we will do, to win some some much larger deals, then you know, we would need to be be doing that to ensure that we we could increase that growth rate to to keep up with the demand. And final question, which hopefully is quite a quick one: What were the main drivers of the increase in net assets? Yeah, so, so if I look at the, the net assets balance, it increased by £6.5 million um, versus 2022. Um, working capital was, was pretty much flat um, year on year. So, so the increase was really driven by the increase in, in cash, which went up by £7 million. Thank you very much. And that's the end of questions. Louis, do you have any closing remarks? I want to thank you all for attending. It's uh, uh, fabulous that, that everyone, so many people were able to join and uh, very pleased to be able to relate the story to you. Thanks again for anyone who's an investor for your support and I hope able to carry on delivering for you.